All right. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, it's great uh, to see all of these familiar faces and some new ones and uh, soon to become hopefully familiar. My name is Daniela Dolenitz, as it says here. I'm not sure if it's uh, visible from the whole uh, room. And I have the very, um, very happy, very pleasant task of uh, moderating uh, the first panel of this year's uh, Green Academy. Uh, and uh, as it's been announced, the title of this panel um, is municipalism. So this is what we'll be talking about. I'm joined by um, four extraordinary women, which I'm very happy to chair. So I will uh, start by uh, introducing them with their names in uh, you know, half a sentence. So just right next to me is Debbie Bokchin, who's from the Institute for Social Ecology, who's traveled from very far from the US. Uh, and then Alexander Strickner uh, from Attack Austria. And then Iva Marcetic, who is uh, an activist of Zagreb and Nash. And then Ksenia Radovanovic, also an activist, but from um, Anadima Beograd. Uh, the four of us have the um, um, you know, somewhat difficult task of introducing um, a concept uh, which has become politically relevant, it has become kind of politically vibrant, and it wasn't a part of the discussion we had in the last uh, Green Academy. Uh, Vedran just mentioned how we have the three modules, you know, climate justice, degrowth, and the commons, but this year, as opposed to the last um, Academy, we said we want to focus it on municipalism, and the commons. And the reason for this is quite obvious. Um, since 2015, there's been quite a proliferation in Europe and beyond of uh, platforms that self-identify as municipalist. Um, and to what extent this is similar or dissimilar uh, to the concept of the commons is something that we'll be exploring in the, in the coming days. Uh, but by way of um, beginning, um, uh, I thought I might um, um, read a few uh, sentences from Kate Shea Baird, who will be uh, one of our lecturers um, in this academy, who I think really beautifully kind of um, emphasized a couple of points about municipalism. One is, uh, she says, municipalism seeks to harness the proximity between local institutions and communities to move towards direct democracy and the co-production of policies as opposed to the delegation of decision-making to elected uh, officials and experts. Secondly, and importantly, and something that we might explore tonight, municipalism recognizes that the permeability between the private and the public spheres at local level is essential for the feminization of politics and the placing of reproductive labor at the center of community life. And the third aspect I would emphasize, she says municipalism values the local sphere as the site for the production of collective identities which are based on civic participation. So these are some of the you know, kind of key words and, and ideas that might kind of help us juggle uh, with this conversation. And how I thought we would structure it is by starting with the initiatives that are local. So with, uh, this is why we'll have Eva speaking first about, um, so from the perspective and the experience of Zagreb and Nash, followed by Xenia, and then Debbie and, and Alexandra, who can give us a bit of a broader perspective, perhaps some of the kind of European level to um, cooperation with local uh, city um, governments and maybe some also conceptual issues. So that's the structure. We'll try and be um, um, a structure so that we have enough uh, time for questions. I've asked the panelists to not take more than 10 minutes initially. Um, in their uh, inputs, and then we'll open it immediately to your questions and hopefully uh, um, get, some, get some interesting inputs from you as well. So the initial questions that I would pose uh, to the panel is, um, we, I said at the beginning, you know, there are now new emergent political platforms which self-identify as municipalist. What does this mean? You know, what are the principles uh, that they um, ground their practice on? And you know the kind of the general topic that this revolves around is social movements on the one hand, and how does that translation translate to institutions, to city governments, to elections? You know this kind of tension uh, going on there. Second, why are we witnessing a proliferation of municipalist platforms now? What is it about the, you know, where is Paul Stubbs, the conjuncture, the social political conjuncture that? kind of uh, breathes um, and makes them effervescent now. And the third one is, um, what are the conditions for their success? And when they are successful, um, um, in what types of change do they bring? So these are kind of the, 
yeah, opening questions. Um, and Eva, please take the floor. Thanks. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, my name is Eva. Uh, I am an activist for uh, Zagreb Nash platform, which is a local platform from the uh, capital city of Croatia. Many of my comrades are here, and uh, we have <laughs> We have just uh, lived this experience of municipal practice of politics for a year now, uh, and it's still uh, very fresh, but uh, it also uh, is uh, something that we can perhaps now uh, think about and assess. Uh, as Daniela asked, um, I would try to, uh, I would uh, say that uh, I can only speak of how a municipal platform uh, emerged in Zagreb in terms of uh, its uh, of our own um, initiatives and our own wishes for it to happen, uh, and perhaps uh, and perhaps say that we were of course inspired by those that were happening in uh, Europe. Why did they emerge in our case? Well, we will all uh, we will uh, we were all uh, at a certain point where. Uh, a certain level of activism and organizing that was going on in different kind of ways uh, around the city was not simply uh, enough anymore to uh, to actually do s some change or actually move forward, I guess. And also it was a bit of an interesting challenge, I think, for us to go into this. But uh, mostly uh, it was this uh, idea that uh, progressive politics should, be, uh, should become or should be grounded uh, in what we do, in what we fight for, uh, for years, uh, and what we understand that politics uh, should, uh, in, uh, should be and who should, uh, who should represent or who should be a political actor. The idea was uh, that all of those that we work with or all of those spaces that we inhabit should become political spaces where uh, where this uh, where we can practice uh, where we can practice politics that would uh, in turn then uh, push through this progressive agenda on the ground. Um, we emerged as, uh, as uh, a number of movements, but also individuals, uh, around 400 of us uh, in the beginning, who actually uh, wanted to do, um, uh, wanted to get into the, uh, into, the municip into the politics of the city, into the institutional politics of the city. Uh, and I guess we had a lot of common ground with uh, what we have seen, in, particularly in Spain, from where we uh, also learned a lot of things. But I would like to say that also municipalism as a theory or as a term is not something that we decided we wanted to be. Uh, it is uh, something that we talk about in conferences, but it's not something that is present on the ground. It's not like we have, uh, th there's a movement that emerged that people are saying we are communists or we are municipalists. Uh, municipalists. It's not something that we uh, talk about. It's the way that we uh, try to organize. I guess that could be uh, this common ground. Um, I'm sorry, the, uh, after common ground, the question was... <laughs> Why are we witnessing the proliferation yeah. now? Like, what is particular about today? I think that for us, it was uh, what was uh, especially uh, um, important was creating this kind of uh, uh, politics uh, that goes beyond of what we have learned that politics in our region are. In our region, we usually. Uh, understanding, uh, understand it as getting into politics is getting into some kind of self-interest um, agenda or uh, something similar, or almost bordering with criminal. And to be a member of a party is not something that uh, that you would uh, that that is. It's something that could be frowned upon. So what we understood is that we can create some kind of political organization that can uh, actually uh, be. Um, allow you to be a political actor in this institutional sense in the elections, but also not be a member of a party or be somebody who actually practices uh, what we have seen that politics are. We wanted to uh, kind of create a different kind of uh, different kind of circumstances for people to get into it, and we were successful at that. I guess we had a lot of people who joined us, but did not want actually did not feel that they were pressured to become uh, a part of an interest group. Um, and I guess uh, that was something that, uh, that was quite, uh, um, yeah, well, in, in, a, in a place where uh, we are all disillusioned with 
uh, mainstream politics, that was the only thing I guess to do. Um, yeah, and. I mean, the third was about success, if you want mm. to address that. Well, after, after a year of, of uh, this, <laughs> I guess my, my uh, idea always was, and of course my comrades, that, that uh, to be successful uh, in this is to create, as I said, a certain amount of political uh, act, uh, activity and political spaces and spaces of so social spaces uh, where we can be, uh, where we, uh, that we can create on the ground. And it was very, um, it was something that uh, can be successful and in terms is, in, uh, sometimes is, um, but it also requires um, uh, maybe uh, a lot, as we've said, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people who are uh, active on the ground in the sense that they produce sustainable networks uh, and sustainable political networks. So what we have tried to do, we tried to do that, but it's been um, just a year, or it has been, I don't know, three years in Spain or something like that. Uh, but we don't know. I, I don't know if we can assess what were the what were the successes in the end or not. I can say that sometimes uh, some sustainability uh, is um, awaiting us. Uh, but uh, for many many of the things, um, yeah. Well, I think I think achieving some kind of um, some kind of political networks, as I said, and activation was a really rewarding uh, for this process. If it's going to be sustainable, we will see uh, in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Xenia. Will you follow up? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, while preparing for this, I was thinking like, what what new can we actually say? Like, we all come from uh, similar groups. Uh, I remember hearing the story from Zagreb, from our friends and from Barcelona and like reading a book of, about our lives, like we all go through the same things. But so, but still like you now, when you ask a question, how do you now connect your municipal platform with politics, with social movements, I still like the, the question, what the hell am I doing here is the one that I most frequently ask myself. But then when you change it to what we are, <laughs> what the hell we are doing here is somehow different. And what we've been doing from 2014 uh, around Nedavimo Beograd or in our different groups uh, to whom we belong uh, is that we are actually as well, we're trying to change the sole notion of what it means to be doing politics and to be political. And what we discovered from 2014 to now is that like the, the act of being political is the one that actual, like the holders of politics today is the thing that they actually use against you. It's like the first trick they do, like if you are against the, any project, in our case, the first step was Belgrade Waterfront project, but like they, they would mark you as a politician and Ironically, that means you're bad because they are good, like they're there to hold politics to themselves. So if you are doing politics, then you are an enemy. And like the, the next thing is they, they, if they have a power to actually model this politics, if they are at the same time keeping it completely banal, then they actually are sucking you into this beer pool of banal po politics. And what was obvious when we entered the election campaign was that uh, also opposition, I mean, that was obvious before, but it kind of, kind of emphasized during electional campaign that like also the oppositional parties, which you, like you have tons of things against them, but you're kind of still holding your hopes somewhere, like they are actually doing the same thing. So, I mean, it goes to the point where if we are, were campaigning, I don't know, like we were trying to develop this uh, system, how we should make our transportation system be more effective and how to uh, make the, it more affordable regarding blah, 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 but then you have uh, parties campaigning for free transportation, like the same ones that uh, made an agreement for the concession of our public transportation system that now they go to the TV and they say, yeah, we want a free transportation. 
then the ones that actually close our municipal councils were the ones that during the electional campaigns hijacked all of our topics and they were like, yeah, we want to open up a municipal. So like complete disaster in point of view of the substance to the topics that we are actually uh, working with. Uh, the next things, uh, like the lessons learned are that like uh, the Political power, like uh, in our case, I mean, I guess we all have different struggles in each of our cases, but like the like like the force, the the amount of threats that you are actually exposed to. Like, I don't want to make this a sad story, but actually, uh, because I mean, we were completely regular people when we started campaigning against Bagler Waterfront, but then we got sucked to, into this. As Eva said, like it, most of the decisions were not kind of, you don't have a path A and path B, you're just following this. Maybe also as a, like a game, like you are constantly re-questioning yourself if you are capable of stepping back to them and you're not, not stepping back, but like confronting them in different ways and you're like, oh, I, I did this, I can do a step further and that's why, that's how we ended up in elections. But then uh, I remember from the first point where we actually, after two years of campaigning, when we had, I don't know, 10,000 people on the streets uh, campaigning against Belgrade Waterfront, that was the first time that we ended up in the newspapers, like the most read uh, pro-governmental yellow press uh, newspapers that my grandma, for example, reads regularly. Uh, our names were there and we were with the title like killing of our then prime minister, now president. Then when it went up to 20,000, we actually, we were really there on the throne as public enemies and foreign mercenaries and stuff like that. So like at this point we have uh, file complaints against, like, lawsuits against 50 people for online threats and more than 10 cases of, like, physical threats that we re received uh, in the meantime. Uh, I almost got kidnapped dur during one of our protests by a par military, like, party police in front of the regular police. And this is something that, like, it's really, like, it's not, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, we actually filed more than uh, like 10 uh, cases, uh, actually lawsuits for all the different aspects of uh, like breaking the law in, to, in this process of Belgrade Waterfront uh, becoming a reality and stuff like that, but nothing happened to that. Uh, so like, so first they are trying to uh, mark you as a politician, but then they are actually trying also physically to pull you out of this by, by posing a real threat on your shoulders. Uh, but speaking of municipalism as a concept, actually what was for me kind of a revelation is that they are actually copying the, the stuff that we do in that sense that if you think about who is the most connected to the ground, and who has the biggest network of local neighborhood uh, uh, not councils, but like it's them, like it's our government party who opens the, their uh, spaces in each of the neighborhoods and actually is more connected to the basic needs of the people and is actually providing them. And since they have all the power to control what basic needs are in this moment, or better say, like the levels of dignity that we have, uh, they have the whole power to actually uh, help those people. So like in our case, people would vote for the government party because they need, I don't know, one liter of oil, like cooking oil or one kilo of flour, which is like the basic needs. And you don't, like if you work long hours and you don't have anything to eat, it's okay. Like you, and you cannot blame anyone for this. So I think it's also important to take this aspect into account that like if, I mean, we say that what we are doing is really putting the real substance to it. So when we are campaigning against Belgrade Waterfront, we are also trying to explain that uh, there is more to it than just the 
development project or stuff like we are trying to explain on this model what how it reflects on our life so maybe when it's not that obvious for this really big government project but then it when it comes down and you know that also to the neighborhood project then i mean we witnessed the people from the government party actually filing complaints that we wrote because they don't want some building to be built on the space where they would like i don't know walk their dogs and play with their children and they know they realize if this building uh, kind of takes away this plot of land. Maybe their child will never be able to go to a kindergarten there because there is no more places to build it. So I guess um, maybe when we speak about municipalism, we should not talk about just like about this. Okay, we are connected to the neighbors and how we talk. It's also uh, important on like to develop this new language or kind of maybe like more. I don't know if I should say educational one, because then you're putting yourself here, but it's kind of discussing the cause and the, 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 like the whole picture to it. And I always feel that like when you read, I don't know, like the rebel cities, when you read this, it looks like they've been developing this uh, model of grabbing the land and extracting values and taking all of our resources away on such a good level. I mean, and it's a real thing, like there is a book how to use your political power to extract everything of value from some kind of group. And maybe hopefully we can develop something like that, maybe not now, but then we, I mean, it's, if it can be, if it can exist in this way, it should be, we should be able to copy it in this way. But also to include all this maybe Mm. I know if it's like the knowledge, but also psychological help maybe, and also financial, because now when you think about it, how it reflects you personally. I mean, I guess in, yeah, I don't want to mark myself as like the third world country, but it's actually a real threat to people because they actually stop themselves from entering politics because there is a real threat that something would happen to them and then like, you, it's a special kind of section in this, how we fight against them. Maybe that's it for now, thanks. Thank you, thank you. I, um, um, I don't want to take up uh, any time really from you, but just to kind of make the link between what Eva and uh, Xenia have been saying. So um, a general mm, um, involvement in politics where politics is a f fundamentally contaminated sphere. Uh, how do you do that? That's like one big thing. And the second thread I saw is kind of the focus on the material needs. And uh, the city is a place where you can be, you know, both directly physical and, and um, very, um, um, in a very direct way, address material needs of people in a counter hegemonic, let's put it that way, so in a counter narrative to the dominant one. I think these are like really important points. But I would, um, I would uh, hand the floor now to, to Debbie, I'm sure you can. Um, thank you, thank you everybody for being here. And thank you uh, for the invitation and for all the work that went into organizing this. It's a, a real pleasure for me. Um, you know, obviously, I think one of the things that you've made very clear is that every municipalist movement does have its own identity. In a certain sense, um, it's critically important, and I think Kate has said this too, that people be able to adapt to their own particular circumstances on the ground. And, you know, so one of the things I just want to say is that the municipalist movements that I'm most familiar with are in the United States, and they have particular, you know, orientations that might be slightly different from the ones here in the sense that, for example, we don't have a parliamentary system of politics. But I do think that there are several sort of common grounds that, lead, that, that actually link these, these movements that are municipalist. And I'm just gonna try and quickly go through a couple of those. You know, one is the idea of a dual strategy. And, and I love this uh, quote, which I, I'm just gonna read briefly from the Olympia Assembly in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Um, and they talk about um, 
exactly sort of how municipalism is something that is, is growing but also needs to be nurtured. Um, they say, while we want to bring about this new world as soon as possible, we approach this work gradually, experimenting with and testing new ideas rather than trying to do everything all at once. This way, we are able to learn and deliberate as a, as a community about the best courses of action to take and contribute to a global just transition away from capitalism that protects people and the environment. So, I mean, I think that that, that fact that desire to really evolve organically can often make it difficult to quantify the successes of municipalism and that and that you know especially in the United States elections are a complicated thing we can't just judge its success by whether people are elected to electoral office i mean there are on the other hand some some great electoral successes and i'm thinking for example in italy where people have, um, you know, the Coalizione Civica in Bologna has elected a couple of people to the city council, and also in Padova, in Padua, uh, they've elected several people. And, and it's interesting that each one has taken its own sort of course in Padova, Padua. Um, people have formed, the municipalists have formed a coalition government in, in uh, Bologna, they've very deliberately stayed outside of government to be uh, an opposition group. And I think that, you know, that's something that we can talk about some more tomorrow, but, but I think that sort of element of really adapting to on the ground is important. And I think another really important defining characteristic of communalism or I'm calling it communalism, sorry, <laughs> municipalism, uh, is that it's so deeply rooted in the neighborhoods. And, and again, you know, it, it, it is very important, as, as others have said, to make that distinction between what it means to just simply elect somebody to office who has a great, have great views and what it means to actually change the whole nature of politics. And when I think about municipalism, I really think about that as a critical, critical feature because, because for municipalists, of course, a candidate is never a lone actor. It's somebody who is mandated. It's a, it's a complete break with representative politics. It's somebody who is really optimally mandated by the local assembly and uh, recallable and accountable. And obviously, again, you know, different, there are different features depending on where you're doing your practice. In Barcelona, in a certain sense, they um, were quicker to get people into office than to build the assembly model. Um, in the United States, I think people are putting a more focus on really trying to build these assemblies and then sort of slowly work their way to uh, running candidates. And, and this brings me to a, another uh, sort of characteristic that I think is very important, and that is education. And I think that, you know, one of the most important things that municipalists are trying to do is to really educate themselves and the people in their neighborhoods. And they're, and they're thinking about this as a very kind of conscious effort of character formation, that if we're going to have a municipalist politics and not become parochial, we really have to change the very nature of politics. It has to become something that, that everybody is empowered to do and that everybody is educated to do. And so one of the ways that they're doing this is that, you know, there are certainly um, study groups in which people are doing theory. They're studying theory together, meeting in small groups and looking at historical issues, philosophical texts. But the other way is very much through sort of the practice. And I'm, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about what that practice means in terms of the feminization of politics. But I think that that is really also a very defining element of, of communalism. 
Um, and finally, I just want to mention sort of the idea of needing to create a solidarity economy, which is, which is also very important. In Jackson, Mississippi, in the American South, this has been a project that's been going on for many years. And, you know, even their name, the name of, of the organization, their cooperation, Jackson, is about really taking control not just politically, but economically. They, and they, in Jackson, they say democracy walks on two legs, one economic and one political. And I think that that also speaks to the need to have real and tangible results, which other panelists have discussed. You know, the different, again, different um, organizations have different uh, and localized concerns, you know, in certain, in certain municipalities, for example, again, in the Pacific Northwest, are very concerned about protecting people who are the victims of hate crimes, and especially with Trump coming into office, those kinds of things have really increased. Other people are working on, um, you know, uh, protecting people's housing. And each one, and I think that that, again, uh, speaks to the need to have very real and tangible results so that people feel that their participation is truly meaningful and uh, that it's not just a sort of a theoretical matter, but that, that, that it's also a way of really incorporating people into the movement. And I'll just, one more example, um, you know, in Burlington, Vermont, where I lived for many years, I now live in New York mostly, but in Vermont, uh, we had, as probably many of you know, uh, for many years a socialist mayor in the form of Bernie Sanders. And it was really interesting to see how much people put energy into his reelection and actually how unempowered they, they were over the course of his mayoralty. And then eventually, of course, he ran for the US House. But what did happen recently is that a municipalist candidate ran in the election and there was a huge swell of support for you know, various issues that this candidate raised. Even though she didn't win, it's left a, a, a legacy um, that I think can be built on next time. So I'll stop there. Thank you, thanks very much. Okay, and finally, Alexandra will give us a, a different perspective of someone who's been very active in the anti-TTIP and other European level um, struggles and the ways in which they connect with, with local city governments, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Daniela. And also, thanks for, for inviting me here and, and to have the possibility to be on this wonderful island and to be with you. Um, yeah, I will speak a bit from a different perspective and perhaps also still make the link why also in countries like Austria, this, this um, new approach of municipalism uh, is more and more something looked upon. Because in Austria, we don't have yet these type of, of experiences like you have been explaining or which we know from Barcelona. So there is no, not yet uh, such um, a municipal platform that, that has emerged. Um, however, the, the reason why we're looking at and why in particular Attack Austria, among others, is also promoting the local level as one level to look at for, for political change is because we have come to the conclusion that when, when you look at, at the whole framework in which um, we are living and operating in terms of the political levels that we have to face, um, we came in relation to the European Union to the conclusion, given the power relations that we have, given also who are uh, the people, the, the parties that now are in government, and uh, we also had, unfortunately, the change to the worst in Austria. At the European level, we don't see any space for the moment that there is uh, progressive policy, politics that can be made. So what you can do at most at the European level is try to, to uh, have an agenda of, of uh, uh, resistance, so resist against trade agreements, uh, resist against other decisions like glyphosate, for instance. Um, so it's a resistance agenda. But 
we don't see a space for, for improvement. At the national level, in many countries, this is similar. In our case, in Austria, we have now a, a conservative far-right government. So there is no space for any progressive emancipatory politics on the way. On the contrary, it's moving backwards. And I think the space that, that we most see for, for where you can look at uh, uh, to, to start a process uh, uh, and where you still have some options for moving forward progressive emancipatory politics is the local level. And it's, I, I would agree with also what you said. I think it's the space where you have most possibilities for the moment for social innovation, ecological innovation, democratic innovation. Um, and it's also the place where you really can connect with people. And in order to, to do this innovation, um, we believe that, that you need to have this, these uh, connections, which doesn't mean that you only should focus uh, uh, on your work only at that level. But that's why in the book we wrote, it will be soon out in English, it most likely will be called in English the European Illusion, why reforming the European Union is, is not possible and an exit doesn't make sense. It has a relation also to the debate that we have in Austria, because it was very polarized in some other countries as well. And one of our conclusions in terms of, well, which way forward, how do we move forward, is to look really at municipalism, to look at the local level, um, and, and how you can start to build uh, change there. But then also how this needs to be connected in terms of, of cooperation at, at the national and the European level. And this is the link I want to make to the experience that we had um, struggling against something that um, uh, is happening at the European and the national level, which is trade policy, European trade policy, is, is done uh, or is, is negotiated by the European Commission, um, given by a mandate that comes from the member states. Um, and one of our strategies we had was to uh, engage with, uh, with the local level, with cities and um, communities, not only cities. Uh, so we also went to the, to the countryside and to explain them how, how trade policy is going to impact the possibilities of uh, the local level in terms of providing uh, public services uh, in uh, limiting their possibilities to use public procurement um, in order to uh, support and foster uh, local economies. And we suggested them to sign a resolution that uh, had no legal effect, but it had a political effect, and to say that they are TTIP free and CETA free. So we tried to connect the uh, uh, I, I assume everybody knows TTIP is the trade agreement with the United States that was negotiated and uh, CETA, the one with Canada. Um, and and um, this became really um, a, a strategy that was pursued in many, many European countries. So overall it was more than 2,500 uh, cities and, and local communities that signed up to it. It even went to a regional level, so provinces that signed, like in Italy you have like almost all provinces that also signed similar statements. Also in Austria, we had some. Um, and I think the interesting thing, and there is a connection that I would want to make uh, with the municipalist um, uh, initiatives that emerged in the meantime, is that um, we could not only use that in order to build political pressure to connect European and, of course, it has a national dimension, politics to the local level and create resistance uh, to that, um, but uh, the new, at that time, recently elected uh, uh, new mayor and, uh, of Barcelona, they started to come up with the idea and say, let's, let's start and meet, let's organize a meeting, and Pablo is here, he was very involved in that first meeting, let's organize a meeting of these TTIP free cities. So let's also create spaces of interaction that are outside of established networks and institutions that cities and local communities have already at, in Europe. Because there is some, you know, there's Euro cities, so they do meet. It's not that they never meet. But it was deliberately to meet outside, to create an own space, and to also make that space together with social movements. And we had one meeting in Barcelona and another one uh, that uh, took place in Grenoble. Um, and, 
which was very interesting and, and fruitful, um, it also proved to be very difficult to, to uh, establish a more ongoing collaboration, which has a lot to do with resources, because in the end, uh, municipalist movements focus a lot on the local level, so how do you get then, even if you're in, in uh, even if you have the mayor's office and you have money there, it's still a challenge, and at the same time movements, for us it's already a challenge to organize ourselves at the European level, and then to organize as well also the, the representatives from the, from the local level, it, it is a challenge. But it's, it's still out there. I mean, there is the connections made. And it's interesting to see, at least I perceive some of the things that I can observe uh, uh, that are happening. I would say there is a strong connection also to, to, to this experience that we did. Like now that we meet here in Grenoble, there is um, uh, a big summer university of social movements that is taking place in Grenoble and within there there is a commons camp and there is a strong in connection uh, between the, the, the work and the discussions that the movements have with the, the local level. So I, I think that's interesting. Also now in Germany there is a, a meeting done that is organized by Attack Germany and other movements with representatives from the local level. Um, on the question of uh, uh, communities and democracy, how to, how to, um, what type of democratic innovation uh, is possible? So these are offsprings of 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 the work that we did, and I think um, that's interesting. And perhaps it's also interesting to to see it also a bit broader that there is also people that are now at the local level, mayors. Also in Austria, we have we have worked and are working with mayors that are, uh, are really open to, to, to moving into a different type of, of uh, uh, doing things. And that's some of the things we are planning with the, the follow-up work we are doing on TTIP in Austria. So it's not only that um, municipalist movements need to be started from scratch, it's also to start and work with those who are open for, for using that space for democratic innovation. So I think, yeah, that's a bit what I wanted to bring in, that it's on the one hand possible, but also needed, that there is a connection made uh, between the politics that happen at uh, another level. And just to make one more uh, example, because I thought it was interesting, and it, 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 it is an example that is an offspring of also the strategy we did. There was this big struggle to, to uh, fight against glyphosate at the European level so that the Commission uh, does not give any more the agreement that glyphosate can be used. Um, and the movements engaged in that uh, work, they also started to use that uh, strategy. So there were glyphosate-free local, I mean, cities and communities. And the interesting thing is in that case, because there is a policy space, not only that was an important level of, of, of uh, creating power from below. There is now a lot of uh, local communities and cities and regions that start to really look into how they can become uh, glyphosate free. You know, it's like we stop using in where we can decide, we just don't use it anymore. So it's also an interesting way of how there can be interconnections um, on that. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very thank you. Uh, thanks to all of you. Um, I think the last input um, um, certainly opens up, you know, some of the broader questions about how do, if we focus on municipalist politics, how does this, does this, if at all, scale up? How do we align, you know, uh, how do we, there's, it's one thing to exchange experiences and learn from each other's struggles, but to tackle issues which are such as migration, climate, and things like that, we need to be able to confederate in various ways and parallel structures and so on. So this is, I think, a very kind of relevant big question. But I, I did say that I would uh, give space to all of you if you wanted to directly address each other. So there's that space if you wanted to kind of say something. But if not, uh, given the hour, I would open it up for, for questions. And then... Um, uh, I don't know how this works. Do I have someone who helps me with the microphone? We didn't. Yeah, I do. Okay, so there he is, Nicola. Um, any questions? Um, or do you want do you want some time to think, to reflect? Oh, there's one. Okay, Yelena will ask a question. Uh, I just wanted to be the first person to ask a question. So. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Yelena, I'm from Zagreb in Russia. I was wondering um, about this issue of uh, feminization of politics. 
Uh, could you like tell us from the experience of uh, Zagreb and Ash, Barcelona and Komu and uh, uh, Nedavimo Belgrade, what does it mean in practice? I mean, and what is the strategy behind the uh, feminization of politics? Uh, and also I would like to uh, commend the fact that we have an all-women panel and I think that we should have it more often. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, the, the thrust of the question is feminization of politics through concrete examples, right? And what does this mean? Maybe what does this imply for a political organization and for the future? Anyone, it, this is not supposed to be like taking rounds, so if anyone wants to take it up uh, or if you want to have... Um, I'll talk yeah. to you a minute yeah. about that. You know, when I think about the feminization of politics, I mean, I, I really think about a huge cultural shift in the way we do politics, which is certainly inherent in the municipalist politics. And, and I think that, you know, it's important not to be essentialist, but to acknowledge that the social transformation that we hope to bring about will entail personal transformations that emphasize values that are traditionally associated with women. And that, and that means, you know, a, a politics that, that is somehow, you know, if you want to use the word caring, you could use it that way, or cooperative, but that, on the, first of all, allows for the real full participation of people who are tr traditionally disenfranchised. And that means very concretely creating structures. It's not just about individual actions, but about structures. Things like being able to provide daycare or hold meetings on weekends, you know, to enable uh, uh, not just women, but traditionally disenfranchised people to be able to attend and participate. And, you know, and addressing things like mobility issues or doing what they call, you know, pro progressive stacking so that the person who raises their hand isn't necessarily the next one who gets to speak, but where we're really sort of looking at um, making sure that underrepresented voices are, are represented. Um, but I also think that, you know, again, it goes back to education and sort of character formation. I mean, in a certain sense, we really have to bring the anti-hierarchical, the, the um, sort of approach that we, we, that we talk about in the society that we hope to create into our everyday politics on, on the communal level, and that we have to um, actually work in some ways very hard at, you know, debating, discussing, and finding ways to interact with each other that allow for us to really prefigure the kind of society that we want to create. I can say one thing, like, uh, from our experience, we mostly work with women. So if we deal with municipal issues or local issues, women are the one who are most persistent and more present, persistent and more present. So we had situations where we as activists work a lot with women for a lot of years, but have seen males at panels and uh, things like that, as you all know. Uh, for me, this cultural change that Debbie was talking about also emerged a couple of years back, or not so long ago, when we started talking about that and we started talking about formal changes that should be made in order for us to grow more. So uh, municipal platforms really had it um, formally embedded in them at first, uh, be it quotas, be it uh, uh, different kinds of... Um, for example, if you go somewhere or give an interview or you're present uh, in the public sphere, uh, you have to have this parity of women uh, and men, which I guess, in my experience and experience of my uh, friends, I think really helped uh, to uh, hear the voices of these women that are working uh, around the issues tirelessly. I am a bit then, uh, again, com uh, not confused, but um, when we talk about it, usually we talk about it uh, meetings in the evenings or uh, um, pushing the meetings earlier or something like that. My experience is quite different with, <laughs> with women uh, organizing my, um, uh, my meetings uh, around the city around 9 or 10 uh, in the evening when their kids are asleep or something like that. Or they might not have them at all, it doesn't matter. 
Uh, it is very strange uh, for me to talk about it in the sense that we can say this is how we organize um, uh, if we want to include women uh, in terms of time and in terms of labor that, 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 that uh, women do today. So it's different for every kind of occasion. Um, and it just is a question, I guess, for me also, uh, for on one side, this formal push for a formal change, which then brings about an organic change, at least in our experience, uh, and uh, also being aware of the situation that you are in and respecting it. I think that's also a, um, a principle that then shapes our uh, activist time or our political time. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that's... Yeah, I would just like to say, like, when <laughs> considering the, uh, the Green Academy two years ago, like, and when we found out that this is going to be a all-female panel, I still like, got the bunch of questions of, ah, why is it an all-female panel? <laughs> like, are you sure that you're there just because of your, like, just by being a woman, or, like, did they invite you because you have something to say and a lot of this things. So even like looking at it at this, just like this, it's still connected with this really need to, even in our circles, which are really kind of progressive bubbles, but still like bubbles, to re-question everything, even when, when we are sure that we respect all the differences, all the needs of everyone, that we still like have to talk about stuff again and again and explain why is it important and and also like by being one woman in an electional campaign and it, this is true that what Eva said it's completely obvious that w women are more uh, active in this uh, like muscle part around organizing everything and still it's not enough when you see like I mean, we never got invited to an old female panel, like, uh, accidental one. It was always <laughs> intentional. So, I mean, so we did not win this uh, in in big enough way to be questioning, is it important? <laughs> like, it is important. But also, I don't know, my, my experience was that I, I, for example, during the campaign, I got tons of uh, comments from male, like, if I talk to someone, I usually would be more, uh, I'm too aggressive when I talk. And then when, from women, they would say, ah, you were too polite. <laughs> like, that was also kind of <laughs> crazy because the other way around, when you consider, like, if you have a like, politician, like, nobody, if somebody is, like, really uh, pushing forward with their agenda and they are all, or they are, like, really, tough people or they are really polite, but in a good way. Like, so, I mean, this is really interesting. And I mean, I'm not still kind of satisfied because I still have some kind of the idea that I probably used more of this, if we have to use this division, which is not that popular, but like I probably use more of this masculine stuff to be able to like create space. For, for for myself in the in this representation representational stuff, but like yeah, there is. I mean, that's why I I mean I don't feel guilty if I'm in all, an all female panel because like you can use this privilege then to talk about stuff. I mean, if I may just enter this conversation as someone who's also active in, in Zagreb and uh, accidentally a woman as well. Um, your your uh, input just reminded me of, um, of a talk I heard um, a couple of months ago in the UK by a, by a Labour MP, a female Labour MP, and she said there was a discussion about uh, how come there's you know female leadership? There's no female leadership in the Labour Party. What's this about? And so on. And she she said, you know, you you really can't as a woman you can't win. You either conform to the gender norm and then you're polite, and you deal with you know care with kindergartens and you know social issues and so on. And it's fine for the party, but then you're not a leader. You know, this is the caring person. She'll be doing stuff in the background, or you don't conform, uh, but then you're aggressive and you're a bitch, and nobody really wants you know, a, a female uh, leader um, who is a bitch. 
So that's, I think, you know, a good summary of what you've just said. So you, you, either, to, either, either way you do it, you don't win. Uh, so there's no good way of doing it. You just have to kind of go through it and, and see how it happens. Uh, but, um, uh, and another thing, I, I'm just underlining what, what Eva said. I think with the thing with the panels and the quotas, you know, and we had, Zagreb Inash had a, a zip system. So we had a, an ele electoral list for the city council, which was fully, um, uh, full um, parity, full gender parity. Meaning every second place was female, male, female, male, because this was a way to forefront this. But of course, you know, the, this um, this type of discussion very often deteriorates. You know, because either you feel as a woman that you're invited because you're, you know, the, the significant other to fill the panel and so on. So the point is that uh, this is only an opener for the conversation. And many times in Zagreb and Nash, we don't know what it means, where it will lead. But it's a it's an uncomfortable question that you pose. I think that's. That's how we put it. And you pose it to yourself if you're getting involved in politics and you're thinking about what types of roles can I take on. Um, uh, generally, it's the supporting role, right? I'll do everything. I'll risk my life, you know, I'll, I'll lose my husband, but I won't uh, go into the limelight because that's the one thing I don't want to do. Uh, but I think with this approach, which sometimes focuses on quota, we keep asking the, the uncomfortable question. We kind of push, I hope we push each other. Uh, to also start um, uh, taking up the non non kind of uh, gender conforming roles right but not to, to hug the mic uh, please I hope we've you know inspired some questions at least or comments or um, a participation from this quiet audience yeah okay there's one question third row and then Yagoda afterwards uh, hi Everyone. Can you tell uh, us your name, please? My name is Mare. I'm from uh, Zadar. I'm a free freelance journalist. I was. Uh, I have a question for Eva. Uh, do you have? Uh, do you maybe have a feedback from other cities in Croatia of trying to do what you are doing in Zagreb, or do you think that maybe uh, Zagreb and can become a platform on a national basis? Can we take? Can we take uh, Jagoda as well? And then can we have the question from Jagoda, and then we'll answer. I can also take reservations, so I can write it down. Thanks. If anybody wants to read well, I recognize myself in the second category, bitch, I must say. <laughs> but um, I'm glad that we opened the debate. Now it's getting more into the feminist debate, and uh, I think it's much bigger debate on like how much of patriarchy we internalize also in our behavior and enforcing the system. But. It's not a question I wanted to ask. I wanted to actually, I think one issue that uh, Xenia mentioned is the issue of safety, of uh, particularly pro probably women in politics. And uh, I'm, I'm okay if you don't want to talk about it, but I think it's something that we should also recognize as one ob obstacle and problem. And the question I have for you is um, like maybe provocative, like, uh, could we consider municipalitism like local politics, like more female kind of politics? Because you deal again with the scare, with the needs of local community, kindergartens, um, you know, um, roads and so on, while power is on national and international level. Mm -hmm. And if we look at what's happening in Europe with the rise of right wing, uh, is municipalism enough? That would be my question. And how you see the scaling up of that uh, let's say positive progressive islands of municipalism around Europe and in this region in particular into something bigger. Mm. Okay. So who feels, who feels inspired to take it up first? I can answer. Eva? Um, Let me try. Uh, about the, uh, that was directed to me. Yeah, I mean whichever. <laughs> you can choose your questions. Uh, right. So uh, the other, the one that was directed at me, I guess that's that's an ongoing discussion about national politics. I can say that for the other cities, of course, there is uh, probably some talk about creating a municipal platform. There are some local options that can be close to it, uh, but um, there is a difference. We had, as you know, uh, local options uh, or the convergence or the co co confederation of local options with most 
Um, but there's a real difference what, what do they politically and which specter, ideological specter they belong to. For me, it's very important. And I don't know, I mean, they might emerge um, uh, more strongly in, the, in future years. I hope they do in other cities. I will not speak to uh, whether I know that would happen or not. Um, as for uh, Zagreb and Ash and the national politics, uh, well, I guess um, there, as it is, it is an ongoing discussion, of course. I cannot say um, what, what is going on with that, uh, what would be going on with that in the end. I can tell you my uh, own personal view on that. Uh, I believe that, uh, and I really, um, uh, do, I believe that, ne that local politics, that is, and this can address also Jagoda's question, uh, or dealing with the city uh, head-on uh, really teaches uh, leftist activists or leftist politicians uh, to deal uh, with people rather than on only issues. Um, so to learn this kind of politic, uh, po uh, polit political job is not an easy task to do. And I don't think it's just like a small local women uh, task. Uh, I'm not sure that all the power lies in the national level. Uh, I think that the cities uh, possess a lot. They have a lot of capital in them. They, uh, they uh, manage that capital. So there is also uh, a power to be drawn from that. Um, and also in terms of our region or uh, national politics, I think that uh, the city politics allows us much more inclusivity because in the city you live and the state you are uh, bound to as an abstract uh, kind of a thing. And especially with us, uh, it's a national state, uh, very uh, ethnically exclusive, uh, and it doesn't recognize identities such as mine, that is uh, multinational or anything. And city is a space where this could happen. This multiplicity can happen and can be addressed. So I think it's a real challenge for leftist politics to address this multiplicity on the ground and to really work uh, with, these, uh, with the concrete issues uh, that reflect on people's lives. I think it's a big move for the left. So, yeah. I mean, so some of the questions of which were more general, one was the safety of women in politics, which I but guess... But maybe we can finish this one and then... Like yeah, um, okay. Alexandra, did you want to address this? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I just think that we should not fall in the trap to think that, that uh, municipalism is the only solution. So I, I think, it's, as you said, it's an important uh, level. I do think that, that most democratic, social, ecological innovation will come from there, mm -hmm. and it's happening already. So I, I just at least don't, don't see the level, the national or the European level where such innovation is happening. It's, it's also too far away from people. But, but we, of course, must, and there is policy issues that are also located at a national or a European level, where we need to, to address that. And the question is, how do you create also the spaces for interaction and, and discussion? We had uh, at the European level from, what was it, 2001 or two until 2009, the European Social Forum, which was the space where movements could meet Unfortunately, I think, I mean, the, the good thing of that is that there has been a lot of uh, connections made between movements, between diff from different countries that we all benefit from. Um, I think what was not made at that time, it was more a space of exchange where people talked about their struggles at home, but there were not enough connections made about you know, how does this connect and where are the levels where we need to start to have a discussion together. And, and I think we need to recreate the spaces. I think we do have it on some issues. We have the, the, the Stop TTIP uh, platform. It's, it's a European platform and it has never been as, as wide as, as uh, it has become as in the past. It was much smaller. I think it is, exists also on other themes. So I think we just need to create these spaces and, and perhaps at one day we might have another one very big one, but, but I think we need to, to create the spaces and have the discussion. So it, it cannot be only the local level. I mean, uh, issues of tax policy or, or 
uh, certain social policy. I mean, you you cannot handle everything at the at the municipal level. So in that sense, uh, I think it needs to be something that is more thought in a dialectic way. And on the safety and politics issue, I think it's something really also to to talk to start talking about and to be open. I think what what you explained uh, also shows, and it's probably very different from place to place, of how power reacts to, to when it's confronted or challenged. Uh, at least I, I have not heard any stories like that from, from Barcelona. So I think it's, it's uh, but it's something we need to address because what we can see overall in many countries, but this is more at the national level happening, is that you have constantly changes in, in how the, po the, the police um, gets more power and more possibility to, to, to do repression and how also governments are, are allowing for repression. And that's of course something that, that needs to be more discussed. How do we deal with that? Because it, I mean, in, it, it's going to be more and more the more that we confront power um, and in that sense, I think it's something that there needs to be a discussion and how do we deal with that? How, how, how you're not left alone with when something like that is happening and how do we defend ourselves? Okay, I think Debbie wanted to address the, the first point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to just talk about this question of the relationship between the city to the region to the state. And, you know, a classical sort of municipalist politics, and I'm really talking about the way it's articulated by my father here, so it's not the only way, but it's one of the sort of principal kind of discussions says that really the reason that we function as much as possible on the local level is because we ultimately want to uh, build a counterpower to the nation state and disband it, that even as we are elected to municipal office, we imagine ourselves ultimately um, being able to uh, do away in a certain sense with the offices that we're elected to so that all power goes back to the national, to the local assemblies. But what I wanted to say is that, you know, obviously in this day and age, and we see this very much, especially right now in the United States, as you do here with Trump, with huge assaults on civil liberties and on human rights. We have to do, we certainly have to function on the regional and national level. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's, I would never say, for example, that we should put all our energy into municipalist politics and not vote for a, you know, democratic socialist candidate. But what, but what I do think is important and is a, is a kind of a danger is to get so involved in electoral politics that we don't really put our effort into, as I said before, sort of changing the nature of politics, that we don't, um, that, and I'll just give a quick example. You know, I lived in Germany in the 1980s and I saw what happened to the West German Green Party. You know, they started out as the anti-party party, and they had a very powerful ecological platform and very radical platform. And slowly, bit by bit, because they were engaging in traditional representative politics, all of those ideals were compromised. And so I think that that's something important to think about as we think about how we're gonna um, interact on the, on the you know, on the national and regional level. And, um, you know, at the same time, to, in order to not sound completely dogmatic, I wanna say that, you know, for example, there is an aspect of municipalist polit politics that says you don't, you have to keep everything to the municipal level. But in the United States, you don't send an off a, a, a candidate to a state or to a regional body because that is the state, which is inherently antagonistic to the municipality. But there are issues, for example, in the United States, communities pass um, local laws, they work very, very hard and they pass a local law, say, against fracking. And then suddenly the state steps in and says, nope, we take away your authority to do that. So I think part of the conversation that we do have to have is, when do we think about running candidates possibly at the regional level? And if we do that, is there a way to do it so that they are truly delegates from the local assemblies and not lone actors? I'll just stop. 
Ksenia, did you want to finish that story? So, uh, yeah. Uh, when it first be started happening, we were like, okay, we are going to be brave about it. So we did not talk that much in public because since we did not have any dialogue, uh, we did not know if what we were doing actually had any effect. But once we ended up in this like headlines as uh, like foreign mercenaries and traitors and threat to our president, we were like, okay, we, now we have them scared. And that was the first sign of our success. So we were so happy about it that we forgot that it's actually uh, dangerous, but then soon we realized it is because after the headlines, then they started this whole Facebook campaign with, uh, like creating Facebook pages, and I'm talking about it because it turned out that there is actual, an actual organization that is actually teaching all these right-wing groups, uh, including our government, uh, how to address uh, the, I mean, traitors like us, uh, how to trash them in public using uh, social media. Uh, so now we have more than 50 people like on our list which we gave to the prosecutor office uh, nothing happened like they actually arrested two people but because include when they threatened to us they actually also mentioned the prime minister so it's it was not because of us that they got actually uh, arrested uh, but then, like, uh, it went on, so uh, when it started happening to our families, like these threats and uh, people following my father like, around the city and stuff like that, then you're like, okay, I mean, you can choose something for yourself, but then they've managed to then to get you agitated because, like, our parents are, it's not their fault we are doing what we are doing. So then we actually started to talk, talk about it, but then also in public, but still kind of being brave about it, but uh, trying to discuss what's happening. But then internally, it's actually connected with the fact that we, I guess, don't take that much care about uh, the psychological, like, uh, what's the word for it, like, um, yeah. Because you can be brave for some times, but then uh, once the adrenaline drains off, you're left with yourself. And then it's, I mean, and not only when you have this kind of uh, threats, it's also when you're campaigning for about something and really, I mean, we all put everything we have into what we are doing. So, I mean, it, like, it gets hard after a while. So, I, I mean, I think that should be actually also included in how, when we are talking about how we connect, how we share our knowledge, it's also how we share this kind of support. Maybe also, I mean, I'm not begging for money, but also, I mean, it can be uh, put that way also, because all, all, all this that we do, when they try to drain you psychologically, they actually are also as well trying to drain you financially. Just by organizing this protest, we are now in debt for like 3,000 euros just for, from a couple of uh, case so orders, and we still like have 30 processes against us for, just for organizing protests. So you can imagine some local group in some neighborhoods are trying to organize a protest. Maybe you don't know that you should actually file for a permission to organize it, and then they give you, because in the meantime, they change this law uh, for like public gatherings, so now like the minimum fine is 1,000 euros. So like, how do you collect this kind of money? I mean, we all can, we can crowdfund, but it's like piling up and piling up if you have some uh, lots of problems as we do. So yeah, I think that that is also important. Thanks, thanks very much for sharing this. I think this is, there's a whole array of ways in which um, activists get silenced, um, as you say, through lawsuits and through um, you know, vitriolic campaigns online, but you know, direct threats to physical security, I think that's really taking, I mean, it's a, it's a strong deterrent. You know, we spoke about how difficult it is for women to take the stand, to take, kind of, you know, to take the limelight, but then in the context of possible, possible physical 
threats and so on, it becomes uh, really almost impossible. You know, my mom would say, you know, kute vrag nosi, <laughs> why are you doing this? I mean, it's good in principle, but not you, you know. <laughs> you should stay at home. It gets uh, really dangerous. Um, okay, so a late hour, ra last round. We can take a few questions or comments or inputs of any kind, um, if there are more uh, from our audience. No? Okay, maybe, maybe then we will slowly wrap up if there aren't um, more inputs from, um, from the panel. I would like to wrap it up uh, with kind of a more of a um, you know, um, positive, inspirational uh, take on it and say uh, with all of the things that we've addressed, uh, I think one thing's pretty sure and that's that um, municipalism as the concept that we chose for tonight <laughs> is surely uh, the space for political innovation, that's for sure. And we've, we've you know, said um, a couple of ways in which this is true. One is the, the context of a deep distrust that we have in political institutions and in mechanisms of representation, and that we want to change uh, ways in which politics are being done, and the city is the location where we can do it, where, where we're physically located, where we can uh, be um, specific in ad addressing material needs of people, and this has been mentioned a couple of times. So this has to do with access to basic utilities, it has to do with right to housing, uh, right to public space. So these are struggles where we can have a conversation, which Eva was saying, in a, in a time in which it's really easy to fall into kind of the game of electoral politics and mediated politics. I think the city level can ground us in a conversation which we need to have, you know, very much with with people out there, right? Um, so um, I would leave it at that, and thank you for your attention. And yeah, I think it's also my role to say we're very strict tomorrow morning. We start at 9 a.m., so please, everyone, be here at 9 a.m. And now an applause for the panel.